All right, we have a letter from Prairie 2 coming up here in a minute, but um, Mark Taylor Canfield in, uh, whoa, got a shiver in Seattle. It is colder than a well digger's ass here in Atlanta, Mark. Hey, we're probably going to get hail here in the next few days. Yeah, well, we had uh, we had uh, ice. We had freezing rain and ice and temperatures in the uh, low 20s. And uh, here in the studio, which is not all that well insulated, uh, it's uh, <clears throat> rather chilly tonight. Uh, the peach trees. I worry about them, you know. <laughs> the, yeah, right. Okay. That's the thing about Georgia. I love peach cobbler. There's nothing better. Yeah, well, that's in South Georgia. We don't have peaches up here in North oh. Georgia. Uh, I, I have I, to import them. Huh? I explained this all the other night. Uh, you must not have been listening. Uh, if, you, if you've ever been to Atlanta or you read anything about Atlanta, you see all these references to Peachtree Street. Right. And Peachtree Way and Peachtree this. I mean, there are like 156 streets or 180 or 210, some outrageous number of streets and thoroughfares and byways and highways in the metro Atlanta area that have the, the, the word peach tree in them. And peaches aren't grown around here. What, what that word comes from uh, is all the pine trees around uh, um, metro uh, Atlanta. And pine, as you know, produces pitch. So what they were talking about, they talked about pitch trees, the people who settled Marthasville and then Terminus, which is what Atlanta was called before it was called Atlanta. It started out as Marthasville and then Terminus because of the uh, railroad lines that dead ended here, but uh, or intersected here. But it's not peach tree in its original form. It's pitch tree. OK. <laughs> Hello? Thank you, Mike. Thanks for that lesson on local Atlanta. Yeah, I hope I didn't destroy any image you have of Atlanta's peach trees. I just wanted to let you know they don't exist. Okay. They're pine trees. Well, I have a friend who used to live in Atlanta. She's now she's a sweet friend. Yeah. Beautiful Southern Belle, and she lives in Ashland, North Carolina now. But at the time, she used to tell, tell me that I was quite a peach. I always thought, you know, well, well the, the, the Allen Brothers, one of their biggest albums, Eater Peach. Uh, we used to have a huge record store here called uh, uh, Peaches that uh, back in the day before, it, this is before CDs and so on and so This is back, as a matter of fact, it was back to eight tracks and, uh, and mini discs and uh, those little, what were those little mini tapes? What were those couples? Huh? Cassette? cassette and dat tapes and all that stuff uh peaches uh and and every time rock and roller would come to atlanta they'd have to go to peaches but the uh, the the irony is there are no peaches here i don't think there ever has been but anyway that's not why you called well although i am in a band you know so i love music and i'm in seattle which is a rock and roll capital so i did know about peaches uh well good i do find that interesting yeah and i am enjoying the music tonight actually so a shout out to the sponsor for, of the program because it sounds really good listening to it on the White Rose. Well, the musician is Daniel Galante, yeah. and uh, uh, the person who uh, uh, is is providing the sponsorship all night is Sal from our chat room. Yeah, Sal was in the chat room. I was just talking to. Oh, okay. Good stuff. Well, basically, you know, we're keeping it lit in Seattle, and I'm sure that. A lot more people are keeping it lit since marijuana was legalized. But <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I, a lot of folks probably don't know because I don't really talk about it much when I when I call in. But I have been a reporter for Free Speech Radio News on the Pacifica Network since 2007. Mm -hmm. So even before I got involved in the Occupy movement, I always seemed to have wanted to to follow really important news stories that just aren't being reported. So I always, when I talk to you, I always want to to bring those up because you're one program where you do allow people to kind of like be Indian, you know, talk about things that maybe not uh, are not straight down the line as far as the political parties are concerned. But I'm following some really interesting stories here, and, and I, I wanted to mention Shannon McLeish again, which is somebody I mentioned to you before. Right. She's a journalist down there in Florida who found out through the Freedom of Information Act documents that she's on a government terrorist watch list. Right. And I, re I refer your audience to Chris Hedges' um, column at Truth Dig for more information because She's obviously a very peaceful person, and it's just a ridiculous sort of overzealous move on the part of those authorities. But it comes from the Freedom of Information documents, which showed military, FBI, police, 
and private corporate surveillance on the Occupy movement all around the country. Oh, yeah, but absolutely. Serious story that, you know, that has a lot of uh, ramifications for freedom of speech. But uh, I wanted to let you know this because it's very topical. Here in Seattle right now, and this is one of the stories I'm covering for Free Speech Radio News, there's a gun buyback program that actually is beginning tomorrow. And King County Executive Dow Constantine is convinced that it will reduce gun violence in the community. It's um, but obviously a political reaction, you know, tried shooting over the last years. But check this out. Amazon has actually gotten involved. They're offering a $100 gift card to anyone who turns in a rifle or a handgun. Mm -hmm. And then, as I understand it, if you turn in an assault rifle, you get $200 cash. So the police federation has donated a bunch of money to this gun buyback fund. So have a lot of local businesses and big insurance company and all sorts of other people. And it's the first time since 1994 that Seattle has offered a, a gun buyback program. But I'm, just, you know, I'm curious. You know, has Atlanta ever done anything like that? Atlanta? Are you yeah. serious? <laughs> this is this is Georgia, my man. <laughs> we may not have peach trees, but uh, I, no. To, to honestly answer your question, um, as as near as I can recall, and I've lived here uh, almost for forty years. No, not ever. I mean, a buyback guns. Jesus God, they give guns away here. There, there's a guy down here that uh, uh, said if you register to vote red, re Republican, which is what he meant. I don't know if he said that, but he had a billboard up. You register to vote Republican, I'll give you. A, I'll give you a, a, a 30 caliber uh, deer rifle. You know, I mean, no, no. You can you can go to local grocery stores down here, or or bank openings, and they have raffles for guns. But a gun buyback? Uh, no. Well, I do have a scoop for you and your audience, and that's something that people don't really know about Washington State. Three quarters of the state geographically is east of the Cascade Mountains. Yeah, and it's crazy out there, isn't it? It's very much cowboy country. It's very <laughs> right. Republican. And right. gun rights and hunting are very, very popular. NRA is really big there. So, you know, I understand what you're talking about. I understand um, that there's been a struggle in this state for years between the Republicans and the Democrats. And they, of course, the folks on the east side have actually talked about seceding at some point because mm -hmm. they don't think, and, you know, and there's some truth to this, that they don't think really that King County and Seattle and Tacoma mm -hmm. really represents the more conservative leading of the rest of the state. So the Democrats end up controlling the government, a pretty progressive Democrats for the most part, mm -hmm. and the legalization of marijuana and same-sex marriage. And by the way, we also just qualified a, an initiative forcing the labeling of genetically modified food and seeds. Mm -hmm. and either, either the state legislature will just pass it because it's been submitted with more than 100,000 votes. Uh, hey, uh, Mark, i got to do a commercial. Hold on a second. I'll come, uh, we'll come back, and I'll give you a couple more minutes. Uh, but hold on while we, uh, while we take a break here. We'll be right back. I'm Mike Malloy. <laughs> 21 past the hour. All right, Mark. Let's wrap it up here. Where were we? Yeah, it was just so to let folks know that, you know, there's a, a new initiative to label genetically modified organisms in Washington State. So, mm -hmm. Well, you know, that was defeated in California. What are your chances in Washington? Well, I was just talking about this the other day at Space Dog Radio, which is a place where I do some broadcasting. And what happened is that you know, normally we're expecting a huge influx of money from Monsanto and you name it. Sure. To try to stop it. So in the meantime, you know, I mean, it wasn't some some of that, you know, kind of campaign wasn't successful in terms of legalization of marijuana. So we'll see what happens with this. But mm -hmm. a shout out to San Juan County because they're the first county in the United States that I know of that actually has banned the growing of any GMOs in their county. Where, where is that? What state? That's in Washington State, and mm -hmm. that, they passed that in November. That's up near the San Juan Islands, you know, really beautiful part of Washington on the border with Canada, the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Mm -hmm. They have banned it already, and now what's happened is that this initiative got 100,000 more signatures than was required to qualify it for the state ballot, but 
because of that, it's been submitted to the state legislature, and they may just pass it. And if that happens, then it'll be the lobbyists, you know, sitting in the state representative's office that will be trying to stop it. So we'll see what happens. But, you know, there's a, there's a good chance. There's a, you know, the fact that 100,000 more signatures were mm-hmm. garnered and were required shows that there's a huge, you know, push for it. So well, yeah, I, <clears throat> I, I so much agree with the idea of uh, stopping GMO uh, or genetically modified foods. I have a, I have a good friend who <clears throat> works um, for non-government organizations. He travels all over the world, and, and what he does, he goes to countries, usually countries that are desperately in need of nutrition programs where, uh, you know, the diets suck, they're, they're killing themselves with uh, cigarettes and so on and so forth. But my friend goes to these countries at uh, his trips uh, paid for and by invitation of the NGOs that operate within these comp- uh, countries. And they're usually so-called, I hate this term, but they're so-called third world countries. So he goes there to try to work with, uh, sometimes with the governments and sometimes not, to um, explain to them about the need for proper nutrition. Uh, one of the ways they do this is uh, by um, getting vitamins into the food supply. If it is uh, uh, if it is a grain product, to fortify the grain product with B vitamins, to fortify uh, this or that with iron, because some, in so many countries, people are suffering from iron deficiency anemia. Uh, they're suffering from um, a lack of vitamin D. Uh, it, it just goes on and on, and, and the attendant diseases that come with that. Now... Sounds like he's a great guy. On the other hand, he and I have gotten in. I've known him for 35 years. He and I have gotten into some screaming arguments because he's in favor of genetically modified food for the simple reason, he says, if food can be modified to the point where it doesn't spoil as quickly. He said, you have not been uh, to places like Moldova, Malloy, so you don't know. You have not been uh, to countries in, in sub-Saharan Africa or, or in South Asia where, you know, food has a shelf life of about 10 minutes uh, because there is no electricity. There is no refrigeration. There is improper food preparation. So his position is that anything that can be done to get nutrition into people, even if it means modifying the organism itself to last longer or or, or to resist insects or or what have you, that that's a good thing. And he makes a very persuasive argument. He's a Yale graduate, so he can talk circles around me. I also think he works for the CIA, but I never say that to his face. So he can talk circles around me. And I don't know how to respond to that because he makes some very, uh, what it seemed to be, salient and valid points about uh, food spoilage, a lack of vitamins and overprocessed foods, so on and so forth, and that the idea of, of genetically modifying certain foods is a good one. So I, you know, I, I just kind of say, look, let's just go have a beer and, and to hell with this. Well, let's, let's talk about something else. I, I just can't do it. You know what I'm saying? Well, I would look at it from a global perspective, which is that 61 countries around the world already require the labeling of genetically modified organisms. Mm-hmm. So we should learn something from that. Well, and I think so. And, and, and I think if, if this is going to exist uh, and, and can be bought and sold and eaten, then I think it should be labeled. People should understand uh, what they're putting into their gullets. And if they don't want to do it, don't do it. And, and I think all the information should be out there, even if the information consists of we're not exactly sure what this stuff is going to do once you take it into your di- digestive system I, you know hey mark i gotta leave it there always good to hear from you i appreciate you checking in okay okay we'll talk to you soon Mike. all right friend take care take care i appreciate it yeah i just get uh jack can argue circles around me he really can uh he's one of the few people on earth that can make me feel like you know i just stumbled out of first grade Thank you.